welcome to Monday, um, and also um, welcome to the Software Heritage Talk by Nicolas Dandrimont. Thank you. Um, so hi, uh, I'm Nicolas Dandrimont, and I will talk to you about the Software Heritage Projects. Uh, I'm really, really glad to be here and to be able to talk to you about Software Heritage. It's been a long year of work, and you'll see that it's just the beginning. So, the soft software is very pervasive. Uh, it's at the heart of our society. Uh, we use it everywhere. Uh, we have software in our pockets. We have software everywhere around us. We have software in our bodies, and it's really at the heart of technology. Uh, appliances in a house uh, contain 10 million source lines of codes. Uh, phones contain 20 million lines of code. Cars can contain up to 100 million lines of code. And it's not going to stop anytime soon. I mean, uh, we're starting to put software in every single thing that's uh, going to market right now. Software is the mediator to access all of our knowledge. Uh, information is one of the main pillars of modern societies done with software. And software is critical to reproduce research. Software must be therefore collected, referenced, and made accessible because it embodies our knowledge and our cultural heritage. Software is really fragile. Uh, have you tested your backups recently? Did you run Git FSK on your repositories? Uh, did you have an account on Gitorius or on Google Code? Both of those have shut down. Software is scattered all around. You know, we have several forges, GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, SourceForge, Alioff, your personal homepage. Uh, CDs in drawers, uh, software is really everywhere. And there is no single standard to retrieve software. There is no uniformity, there is no stability. Uh, URLs change uh, often. Uh, even in Debian, we change the URLs to our repository quite often. Software migrates. It moves from one hoster to another because hosters close, hosters change policies. So. With the Software Heritage Project, what we are trying to do is to collect, organize, preserve, and share all the software source code machines to execute. So software is executable and human-readable knowledge, which is an all-time new. Even hardware is software, with FPGAs, with uh, ASICs, and text files can be interpreted forever. Of course, software evolves over time. Uh, the development history is really important to understand software. And software is really complex. Uh, it has a large web of dependencies. We get millions of lines of code. So software is not just another sequence of bits. We need to be able, in a software archive, to make sure that we can interpret the software its history, its dependencies, everything that we need to understand this tiny C file that exists on your hard disk. So Software Heritage is working on the foundations. We're building uh, infrastructure, base infrastructure, to allow for all the applications that you could use a software archive for. Cultural heritage, industry, research, education. We're laying the foundations so that people can build applications on top of our archive. We're preserving the world software heritage by building a structured archive of all the world software so we can preserve the knowledge that has been put in science and technology over the last years. We try to enable continued access to all digital documents and information. And we're creating a building block for thematic portals and collections of software. 
we try to build something that can be used to create better software for the industry. Uh, the idea is that um, a lot of companies have been running software for dozens of years and have completely lost the source of their software. This is unacceptable because when you have a bug and you cannot fix it, lives can be at stake. So we need to ensure the long-term preservation of critical software. We intend to ease the vulnerability tracking to get more secure software. And we will make sure that software is traceable so that we can better integrate software and so that we can make sure that, for instance, uh, when someone reuses a piece of code, uh, they're, I mean, they're using it correctly, license-wise, for instance, for GPL compliance. Of course, we're also trying to support more accessible and reproducible science. The global library referencing all software used in research fields. So we are completing the infrastructure for open access in science. You get open data, you get open access for papers, and you need to be able to have open source code to be able to reproduce the results. And we enable large-scale, verifiable software studies with a comprehensive archive of billions of source files. So, that's a lot of talk, but really, what do we do? So, meet the team. Uh, we are seven people who have been working for different amounts of time. Uh, Roberto and Stefano have been working on the project for the most part of two years now. Uh, Antoine and myself has, have been recruited as engineers during 2015. Uh, this summer, we've had two interns working on front end and back end. And uh, Guillaume has been advising us uh, on industry issues. Our stack is hardware hosted by Inria, who is a big sponsor and initiated the project. It's currently just one big hypervisor with a dozen virtual machines, a high density storage array uh, with 300 terabytes usable. And to be safe, we have another copy in another server room. So we have the duplication of this hardware. And we're working very hard to enable a mirror network to make sure that our contents can be kept as long as possible. Our software runs Debian. Every machine runs Debian. We use PostgreSQL for metadata storage. We use Python 3 and PsychoPG2 for the backend. Flask for web apps and RabbitMQ for task scheduling. So we're using only free software. And we're building free software. Our values are those of Debian. We use 100% free and open source software licenses, GPLv3 for the backend code, uh, AGPLv3 for the front end, so it stays free forever. Apache 2 for the Puppet manifest, because that's what the community of Puppet developers uses. We really encourage bug reports and code contributions for everyone interested in pursuing our software preservation mission. And to do that, today, we are opening our forge. So, as a thank you to Debian, and I mean, we've timed the opening today. Uh, so, thanks to the Debian community for what it has brought to us. So, we have this infrastructure. What do we have inside it? So, it's really exciting to work on such huge amounts of files, of commits, of projects. We've got replicated all the known for GitHub repositories. That's 22 million repositories. Those 22 million repositories contain 600 million commits and 2.6 billion unique source files. We're also importing all the Debian packages from snapshot.debian.org, and we have imported the GNU project's FTP archive. But we didn't stop there. We also have been talking to Google, and we have been fetching all of Google code before it closed. So we have the 12 million, uh, 12 million Google code repositories 
ready to be imported. We also have talked to the archive team about Gitorius, and we have a copy of the two million repositories that were on Gitorius. We're storing all our files, all our Git repositories as loose files, so each and every single version of each and every source file is stored as one flat file in, uh, in a file system. And on top of this file archive, we have built a Postgres database for all the metadata. So the metadata is basically one big uh, directed acyclic graph inspired by the Git model where at the bottom layer, we have contents, which are blobs, which are files. Those contents are stored in directories. Those directories, so software, uh, software source code uh, is organized in revisions. So you do iterative changes. So those revisions are stored in our database. Our releases of the software are stored in the database. Then. On top of that, we have origins, which are the source repositories that we're getting data from, and occurrences, which are at every point of time where we looked at a repository, the branches that were available, pointing to every single one object uh, at the bottom. So this is probably the biggest um, distributed VCS graph in existence. Yes, so 120 terabytes of files on disk, 3.1 terabyte Postgres database for the metadata, 2.7 billion files, 2.2 billion directories, 600 million revisions, 12 million people, 5 million releases. The biggest DVCS tree in existence. What will we do? We have a lot of planned features. So right now, our website allows you to look for contents by hash. So the idea is that if you have a file, a source file, you can put it in a box on our website and make sure that Software Heritage has archived it. What we want to provide is provenance information for all the content so that we can say we have seen this file at that date on github.com slash foo slash bar. We want to enable people to browse the content because putting all the software source code in a box is not what we want to do. We want to enable everyone to look at the source code. So basically, we are trying to build a Wayback Machine for software source code. We want to enable full text search in all of our archive. That's, that would be quite a prowess. 2.7 billion source code files that you can search into instantly. And of course, what we want to do is to enable people to download every single bit of software that Software Heritage has archived. And basically what we, want to, what we could provide is a Git clone for every data source that exists, whether it is a Git repository, an SVN repository, a Debian a source package, we will enable you to git clone from Software Heritage. Of course, there's also many more applications one could imagine. All of the world's software at your fingertips in a single graph. We also have a lot of technical challenges because software changes all the time. So we have to handle the backlog and all the data that we have saved as a one-shot import which is the GNU.org mirror and the snapshot Debian org archive, we need to make sure that we can keep up with new updates. We also need to make sure that we get the new repositories and commits on GitHub. We need basically reliable, standardized, even feeds that we can tap into and that people can send us or can provide us for us to be able to update and make sure we stay up to date. And of course, all the software is not on GitHub, all the software is not in Debian, all the software is not in the GNU project, so we need to expand. We need to discover and classify all the software sources, which means that if you have a forge at your company, 
and you do open source, we can get your software. If you're a Linux distribution and you have a forge, we need to get your software. If you know of someone's web page where software is released, we need to get it. We need to get everything. And of course, not everything is in Git or in the table or in the Debian package. So we need to make sure that we have importers for all the, ver the, all the version control systems. We, st we have started work on an SVN importer. We need Mercurial importers, DAX, whatever. It's a wonderful playground if you have time to help. So how do you help? Our forge is open on forge.softwareheritage.org. You can subscribe to our mailing list, uh, swh-devil at inria.fr. Uh, the link to the subscription page is on the slide. And you can take a look at our wiki, where we store the public information about the project. If your company or your organization can join us as sponsors, we are welcoming support from everybody. In Inria has initiated the project. INRIA enables me to be here today. Uh, INRIA is the French Institute for Research in Computer Science. Uh, INRIA contributed to the birth of the W3C. 4,500 people work there, many prestigious scientists. And recently, INRIA has worked on TLS vulnerabilities uh, and on lots of stuff that have been made public recently. INRIA is fully supporting the bootstrap phase of software heritage, but we do need the help of everybody. So if you think your company can help us, more info is available on our website. Software Heritage. It's a revolutionary reference archive of all the software ever written. It's a unique complement for development platforms like GitHub, and we're building an international open nonprofit mutualized infrastructure. And we're ready to work with you. If you have any questions, feel free to ask right now. Or you can contact us by email, and you can look at our website. Thank you very much for your attention. If anyone has questions, speak now. Um, wait the time. Um, so the software that you've used you're using and has, has been written, do you think that could be used also for Snapshot Debian Org as the front end? So, um, currently we're using Snapshot Debian Org as a data source, so... Yeah, just the designs <laughs> you were talking about sounded very similar to what we already have, which is not very worked on very much at the moment, so well, maybe it would be better for us to be using so I think the, the same code base. Right. So the main difference between what's been done with, with Snapshot Debian Org and what we're doing in Software Heritage is that we're unpacking all the source files, which Snapshot the Debian Org doesn't do. Uh, Snapshot just has a pool of files that existed on mirrors at... Do you also keep the, uh, arc, the um, tables? So yes, we are storing the tables uh, to be, so uh, we have, yes, right now we're keeping the tables. Uh, we're not sure that we're going to do that long term uh, because tar changes uh, and as we know with pristine tar for instance. Um, so we want to make sure that the software is available now, is available in 10 years, in 50 years, in 100 years. So the only really, um, the only thing that allows us to do that is to store the plain source files. Yes. Uh, also a big difference with uh, Snapshot Debian Org is that Snapshot Debian Org stores binaries. We do store binaries because people put everything and anything else in their Git repositories, but we are not really interested in that. Uh, we have a file size limit, uh, which is currently set at 100 megabytes, and we are not importing anything bigger than that because 
it's very, very probably not source code. So we don't currently have the infrastructure to store big files. Um, related question, um, no, suggestion. The Debian derivative census is downloading source packages from a whole bunch of derivatives. Um, maybe do you like to also yes. store those files? Very much. And we'll talk later about that. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, it looked pretty much that you did your own storage writing to disk directly. Yes. Uh, have you ever investigated using cloud technologies like Swift, ClusterFS, Sheepdog, uh, uh, whatnot? Yes. And RoofFS is nice too. So uh, we've started with a very limited budget. So we had to do what was the most dense storage for our price, uh, price tag, basically. So we went for the very simple solution. We've optimized for data ingestion. So we have been able to import 2.7 billion files in a year. But of course, we need to make sure that we can retrieve those files, which is currently not very efficient with our storage. So yes, we, have, we are starting to investigate over, uh, over storage, uh, storage capabilities. The main issue we have with file storage is that, so we have 2.7 billion files. The median file size is three kilobytes. So the files are very, very tiny. They are source code files. So for instance, the Git storage model breaks down uh, very bad with so many files. And well, I mean, yes, we need people that know storage and that can help us uh, improve on that. So the other question is, did you investigate archiving language specific repositories like, I don't know, CPAN, PyPy, Maven, these kind of things? So um, currently we are focused on GitHub because uh, basically it was a low hanging fruit. Uh, it's very easy to clone a Git repository and it's very easy to unpack and to make sense of the metadata that there is in the Git repository. Of course, we want to archive everything and uh, getting language specific forges is a very important step towards that. So we're welcoming any help in doing that, yes. Uh, yeah, very interesting project, uh, but not all software written by scientists is open source and not all data they publish or they produce is open data. So do you have training material, training courses for scientists and for students to convince them? So um, Roberto Di Cosmo, who is leading the Software Ed project, has done a lot of outreach uh, in the open access community and in the research community in general to underline the importance of writing, open, of writing free software to enable reproducible research. So yes, I think we do have some training materials that must be available somewhere. Uh, I think you should send an email to info at softwareheritage.org and I'm sure Roberto can point you to some material. Hi. Hi. Uh, so this is a this is a ridiculous question, um, but I think this is such an important project for humanity. Are you planning for the apocalypse? <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, for instance, by planning to have an occasional snapshot put in a, you know, as secure mm. of a facility as you can find possibly with a computer that could be used to All right. access it. Um, so we haven't done any plans for the apocalypse yet, uh, but uh, our Interns or intern working on backend storage uh, is starting, is enabling us to have a leader follower model for, uh, for our uh, storage. Uh, we need to put something in place to be able to replicate the database. Uh, replicating the database has lots of issues because we have something like 4.5 million people, so 4.5 million email addresses that are easy to pick. Just take a big list and you can spam everybody. So um, there are some considerations there. Uh, making snapshots is, of course, a possibility. Uh, it's going to need a lot of storage, but it's certainly doable. Yes. I, 
for now, we haven't thought about it yet. But yes. <coughs> Another security-related question. Mm -hmm. There is an interesting article about the, a forgery, um, the Gospel of Mary or something like that. And since you're now an archive, you might become the target of people trying to rewrite history or even mm. remove leaked documents or something like that. And in some cases, that might mean just deleting it entirely yes. to, to obfuscate the fact that it's been done. Mm. Do you have any mechanism to worry about that? Or, um, so uh, every single uh, identifier for objects in our database is intrinsic, which means that it's a hash of the content of the object. So for instance, files are identified by their uh, hashes. Uh, directories, we write a manifest saying this directory contains the file with such ID and etc. And we hash that and that is the identifier of the directory, etc. etc. for all the layers of uh, software heritage. To be resilient to attacks, what we need to do is have mirrors everywhere. The idea is that if you copy information, you cannot remove it anymore because it's everywhere, it's pervasive. So this is, this is really what we want to focus on now is making sure that we have copies everywhere in the world, in every jurisdiction in the world. So we can make sure that if a government wants to take us down, if someone wants to rewrite history, then the history is available everywhere and they just cannot physically do that anymore. The previous talk, Karen mentioned uh, software registry. Is there, is there any relation to sof the software registry he was talking about? Uh, no. I wasn't at her talk, so I'm not sure I can, not sure I know what the software is, so, but we can talk about it, yes, I'm sure. Is that everybody so far? Any more? Does anyone see if there's any question from IRC, maybe? Okay, thank you everyone.